Hi everyone, I'm Dan Bartlett. I'm the curator of exhibits here at the Elmhurst History Museum and I want to welcome you to a very quick little look at our brand new exhibit, People of the Prairie, 12,000 Years in DuPage County. Um, this exhibit, as the title implies, is a broad look at um, the human history of kind of the western suburbs writ large um, since the arrival of, of humans in this area about 12,000 years ago. Um, through a lens of how people lived, right? How were their communities organized? How were their families organized? What did they eat? Um, how did they use the landscape? So throughout the course of the exhibit, in each section, um, we're referring back to how people lived in the past in similar ways to, to the way we use the landscape and the environment today. So that's the first track running through the exhibit. The second is about how we know these things. So it's an archaeology exhibit. The materials that you'll see in the exhibit gallery um, are all archaeological materials that have been found in the, in the area, the Chicago area, that help us understand how people were living across the centuries, uh, and also how the science of archaeology works. So how do archaeologists make sense of the material that they find um, in the ground? So come on with me. Archaeologists divide the broad sweep of time into different periods, and our exhibit does the same thing, beginning with the Paleo-Indian period. Now, we don't know exactly when the first people arrived in, in the DuPage County or the, the Chicago suburbs, but we know that around 12,000 years ago, um, people butchered uh, a woolly mammoth in southeastern Wisconsin in Kenosha County, maybe 60 miles from here. So it's reasonable to assume that they're moving through what we know as DuPage County in the western suburbs about the same time. Now, the exhibit is titled People of the Prairie, but that's not exactly an accurate um, description of what the, the climate was like at the time the Paleo-Indian people were moving through the area. At the end of the Ice Age, this area was very much like parts of, of Alaska are today. So the uh, the climate was very cool, it was damp, there were spruce and ash forests, um, the megafauna of mammoths and mastodons roamed through our area, so the landscape would have looked significantly different than it does today. Um, through our area were small groups of people, probably um, small family groups. They're moving hundreds of miles a season in search of these large game animals. Uh, and we know that because they were making their tools from very specific kinds of rock called chert, and they were taking this material from quarries that might be hundreds of miles from where materials were found. So for example, the Hawk's Nest site, um, which is maybe 20, 30 miles from here to the northwest, is found um, tool-making debris from a kind of chert that's located 180 some miles to the southwest. And archaeologists find this a lot in Paleo-Indian sites, that the chert that they find at a specific site is hundreds of miles away from where it would have been mined. And so we know then that Paleo-Indian people were moving widely across the landscape. Um, working together, they were able to take on even the largest animals like the mammoths and the mastodons. It's interesting um, to think when, uh, when we're thinking about what the climate and, and the environment looked like in this area at that time, to think about um, what the end of the Ice Age was actually doing to uh, what becomes Lake Michigan. Um, at the beginning of human occupation of this area, uh, the lake is 40 feet higher than it currently is, and the lake shore um, is as close as Brookfield to, if you're in Elmhurst, um, you go seven, eight miles and you're at the shore of what becomes Lake Michigan. Over the next several thousand years, the lake level actually drops about 400 feet, and the lake shore moves to be about 30 miles northeast of its current location, um, and so people are living in areas that are now submerged underwater because the lake refills, it overflows, and finally begins to stabilize. Um, maybe uh, 3,000 years ago, um, and the, the current modern climate begins to emerge. Following the Paleo-Indian period, archaeologists identify a long period of time that they refer to as the Archaic period. The Archaic period is divided into three periods, um, early, middle, and late, uh, maybe not the most creative uh, divisions of the Archaic, um, but oftentimes these longer periods are subdivided based on changes in technology 
um, or behavior that archaeologists are able to identify. And it's important to remember that across the country and even across the state of Illinois, um, the Archaic period, the Paleo-Indian period, the later Woodland period, the different early, middle, and late sub-periods um, within these larger um, lengths of time, these happen in different places at different times. Um, so when we say here that the uh, Middle Archaic begins at 6000 BCE, that's specific to northeastern Illinois and other parts of the country, other parts of the state, that date might differ. And it's also important to remember that people don't wake up one morning and say, okay, we are no longer living in the early archaic, now we're living in the middle archaic. The changes in um, technology and life ways that people are undergoing um, over these thousands of year periods are very, very uh, long, drawn out processes of change. So it's important to remember that there's, um, the dates that we use in the exhibit are, are squishy and that um, changing culture and technology takes a long time. We find a lot of stone tool remnants and the debris from stone tool making that are related to the Paleo-Indian and Archaic periods. And a lot of that has to do with how uh, well or poorly different kinds of materials persist over time in the ground. So um, organic materials like bone, uh, antler, um, wood, those are the kinds of things that will decay at a much faster rate than stone. And so that's why a lot of our understanding of Paleo, Indian, and Archaic peoples is based on the tools that they, the stone tools that they were using. And across the Archaic period, we know that people are moving around less than they were in the Paleo, Indian period, again, based on what kinds of chert they're using and where it comes from and where we find it. Um, but you begin to see some interesting changes in the technology across the Archaic, including um, the use of ground stone uh, material. So where a lot of the, the stone tools that we're finding are from uh, chipping or, or napping, flint napping, um, we also in the Archaic begin to see the use of ground stone tools or tools that are made by chipping away little parts and then polishing or grinding them into specific forms like axes. Um, we know that people in the Archaic period began to use a special tool called an atlatl to throw their spears um, farther and with greater force, so it improves their hunting capability. And we find these interesting pieces called banner stones that may or may not be an attachment for an atlatl to make it more, um, more of an efficient tool. But we began to see a greater variety of tool forms, and we began to see the use of these ground stone tools as we move across the Archaic period. So across the Archaic period, uh, people are dealing with a lot of climate change. I mentioned before that the lake level is rising and falling as the glaciers recede and the outlet to the Great Lakes changes. Um, uh, but the modern climate begins to develop and the prairie that we understand as um, kind of the quintessential landscape of Illinois um, is really solidified by about 1000 BCE. So the, no, the, the idea that the state is covered with, with prairies um, and uh, oak savannas, the kinds of landscapes that European settlers found when they first arrived, that's pretty well established by 3,000, 3,500 years ago. Now the woodland period is a period marked by a lot of technological um, advancement. Um, the climate has stabilized. Archaeologists a lot of times will demarcate new uh, periods of time based on technology. And the woodland period is generally thought to begin when people start to make ceramic um, pots. Uh, it's a technology that allows people to um, cook and store food in new and different ways uh, and also to express themselves artistically or culturally through the decorations of the pot. So the woodland period across the woodland, which is again organized into three um, distinct phases, we see a lot of technological development, beginning with ceramics, um, moving into uh, the genetic engineering of maize or corn so that it can survive and thrive in the climate of northern Illinois. Um, the development, the domestication of more and more types of seeds, and then finally ending with the development of the bow and arrow um, in, as the beginning kind of the, the late woodland period. So across the woodland, there's a variety of technological innovations. 
So I mentioned that uh, the, during the late woodland period, uh, people developed the bow and arrow. So about 1500 years ago, um, the bow and arrow was invented and it replaces a lot of spears and atlatls and things that people were hunting with before. And what I wanted to talk about is that a lot of times the materials that you see in the exhibit, a lot of people would refer to as arrowheads. Um, but the fact is that the vast majority of the stone points that you're seeing in the exhibit are not arrowheads, but they're things like spear tips and knives and scrapers and other things. It's only a very short period in the archaeological record in northeastern Illinois that you find um, a lot of actual arrowheads, right? So the variety of stone tools that people are making and using is really pretty impressive. And so we've included a small section that talks just a little bit about lithic or stone technology. I mentioned already the differences between maybe chipping stone like chert versus polishing and grinding stone. So we've got some examples here of both of these techniques. Um, being practiced. But the variety of tool forms is really very interesting. Starting around um, 1000 CE, um, we start to see some really interesting uh, differences in people living in our area. And archaeologists have named these people uh, Langford uh, and Fisher. And we don't know what they called themselves, um, but the Langford people are, are named after the archaeologists that first recognized them in the archaeological record. And the Fisher people are named after the site at which they were first recognized in the archaeological record. But again, we don't know what they called themselves. But it's very interesting because they live in, this, in northeastern Illinois. They live side by side, um, but they practice um, agriculture and um, some of their agriculture, uh, the way they farm and the way they make ceramics, for example, are quite different. Um, and that is an interesting, um, you know, kind of cultural development. So you're living side by side, you're making ceramic vessels that are very similar in design and very similar in shape, but one of them is adding ground shell to the clay and another is adding um, kind of small sand material both of these are called temper and they affect the way that uh, how the the pot um, is able to survive the firing process for example so very similar forms and decorations but different temper langford people are farming along the fox the des plains um, the northern dupage river down along the illinois and they're typically farming on um, terraces above the river valley where the fisher people um, you know living along uh, Calumet, Kankakee rivers, more um, in the, the, the what we call the southern lake plain area of Cook County are farming on the flood plain um, using different kinds of tools and different kinds of cultivation techniques. Um, as I mentioned, these people are interacting with each other because we find Fisher ceramics at Langford sites and vice versa. It's possible that Langford people were um, mediating trade with people further to the north. Um, so we're finding uh, materials moving through the area that would have had to have come through Langford hands before they reached the Fisher people. Langford people used local chert to make tools. Fisher people preferred a chert that was from further away down the Illinois River. But this is the point at which we begin to see some very interesting local variations in the way people live. So I think this might be what most people think about when they think about archaeology the formal excavation, um, measuring off um, distinct excavation units of a specific size, um, digging down, um, noting the changes in the stratigraphy as you go, very careful recording of what's here, um, screening of the material. And so this might be what most people think of when they think of archaeology, but archaeology actually encompasses a lot more than this. A lot of archaeology is a lot less glamorous than full excavation and involves um, survey of in various forms using maps using uh, aerial photographs using um, laser-based lidar topography or doing um, pedestrian walkovers of plowed fields or sh uh, shovel probe surveys um, archaeologists will come to a site where they ex uh, suspect there might be um, 
archaeology, uh, archeolo archaeological remains present. They mark out the ground um, and walk lines called transects and they'll dig a hole in the ground every five meters or so. Take that material, screen it, um, find out what's there, replace it, replace the sod, um, and move on, um, covering many, many acres doing a survey of this kind. And while it seems very random, it's actually a great way to find um, concentrations of archaeological material that can then lead to more um, developed, more formal excavations of the kind that we um, are exhibiting with the unit that we just saw. So if survey or shovel probing locates a potential site and it's determined that more excavation is warranted, you'll find a more formal, full uh, excavation of this kind. But even this is a fraction of what archaeologists actually do because once they've pulled material out of the ground, once they've taken careful records, for about every hour they spend digging in the dirt, they spend three or four hours in the lab trying to make sense of what they've found, analyzing soil samples, analyzing the archaeological material that they've, um, that they've recovered, comparing what they've found versus what archaeologists have already found um, in the area and across the region. So there's a lot of archaeology that goes beyond what you see here in this formal excavation unit. A lot of archaeology happens before and a lot more happens afterward. So the, uh, the nation that gave our state its name, or the Illinois uh, people, the Illinois Confederation, um, is a, was a group of 12 to 14 tribes related by language and custom um, and kinship and other ties that moved into Illinois probably in the middle 15 or late 1500s. Um, and they adopted a lifestyle uh, life, life ways based on uh, bison hunting. Now we think of the Great Plains as being the home of the great uh, bison hunting native nations. Um, but as uh, bison began to move and live in herds of hundreds in northern Illinois, the Illinois took advantage of that uh, and developed uh, life ways based still on farming but also to a large extent on bison hunting. And the materials that we have on exhibit that relate to the Illinois come from the Starved Rock area uh, with our thanks to the LaSalle County Historical Society for sharing some of these pieces. Uh, but there are two kinds of categories of objects that we have here on exhibit. And the first um, relate in large part to the importance of bison to the Illinois. So, the largest piece here is a bison scapula or the shoulder blade. These were used by uh, many, many native peoples uh, to turn into hoe blades. You can mount that thing on a stick um, and you've got a, a very important farming tool. But around the bison scapula we have tools related to the processing of meat and hides. So a variety of different scrapers found in the area. We have arrow heads um, that would have been used, of course, for hunting the bison. We have special tools uh, like sanding blocks that would have been used to finish uh, arrow shafts and things of that kind. And archaeologists find a lot of this material culture related to uh, bison hunting and the importance of bison to the Illinois. Now the second category of objects that we have here are trade goods, European materials that are reaching the Illinois before the Illinois have actually seen a European. As the fur trade begins, many tribes, before they ever see a European, are well aware of the kinds of materials that Europe can provide because native peoples are trading with each other. Or in the case of the Illinois, they're making journeys into Wisconsin to places where Europeans, the French in particular, have established trading posts where they're able to trade for some of these goods, which they in turn will trade further south and west. So these materials here, um, a lot of copper and brass that native people uh, are working into familiar objects of adornment in many cases. Uh, so little beads, little uh, tinkling cones, um, other decorative items. Um, they're also uh, getting uh, glass beads from the Europeans. And of course, these open um, many, many 
ways um, for uh, native artists to express themselves um, right up to the present. Uh, bead working, um, bead design work still being a very important part of um, Native American uh, culture and artistic expression. And these beads actually arrive before the Europeans themselves do. And so we have some fragmentary evidence from the Zimmerman site near Starved Rock demonstrating how these materials are moving through Illinois prior to the actual arrival of Europeans when Marquette and Joliet arrive about 1673. So the fur trade uh, was initially based on the beaver, right? Uh, Europeans wanted the beaver so that they could make hats uh, and of course there were plenty of these animals available especially in the northern parts of North America. But the fur trade encompassed a lot of other different kinds of pelts and furs um, and we have a variety here. Um, it's important to remember that in Illinois, northeastern Illinois in particular, the beaver is not a terribly uh, common animal and would have been hunted to uh, near uh, disappearance uh, very quickly on, but native peoples were able to take advantage of a lot of other different kinds of furs that Europeans also desired. And so here we have a variety, um, you know, deer, muskrat, uh, rabbit, coyote, bison, and all of these were traded um, to uh, Europeans um, in the fur trade. Uh, the materials that were available to native people through the fur trade um, changed the way they lived, of course, um, where uh, trade cloth becomes available to them. They can now make clothing out of fabrics as opposed to animal skins, um, metal tools, um, uh, brass, copper pots, and these are oftentimes um, broken up into raw material. We mentioned before some of the kinds of adornments that people like the Illinois were making. Um, iron axe heads, uh, sashes that could be taken apart and woven into other uh, interesting things. Alcohol has a very important and very, uh, very uh, uh, negative impact on a lot of native uh, communities in the course of the fur trade. Smoking pipes, um, fire starters, so a variety of European goods uh, become available to um, native people during the course of the fur trade. So there were a lot of very interesting things that native people got out of the fur trade, but let's not forget too how important the furs flowing the other way were. And it's interesting um, that in the very earliest uh, decades of the fur trade, each side thought the other was quite foolish for the price they were paying. And so we've got a couple quotes here from the, the early 1600s that kind of encapsulate that. Englishman Robert Jewett saying, the people of the country came flocking and brought us beaver skins and otter skins, which we bought for beads, knives, hatchets, and other trifles. So the, uh, the English are believing that they're paying nothing for these valuable furs. Um, a Native American trader responds that the English have no sense. They give us 20 knives like this one for one beaver skin. So the fur trade is really a very uh, beneficial relationship for both people, especially in its earliest uh, centuries. Now as time progresses and native people become more and more reliant on the flow of trade goods from Europe, the, the power dynamic begins to shift. The fur trade is really about um, a global economy, and we like to think that the global economy is something recent, but it's not. And it is also a story about global um, politics of empire between France and Great Britain and then later, you know, uh, introduce the United States into that. The French never really pursued the settlement of, of this area in northern Illinois. The British actually discouraged it. The United States, of course, was all about it. Um, and a lot of problems ensue for native people as the transition uh, political control, European political control passes from France to Great Britain to the United States. There's a fundamental difference, of course, in the way native peoples look at the land versus the way the Euro-American settlers look at the land. The land uh, belongs to everyone from the Native American perspective. It's there for everyone to use uh, and everyone to benefit from. The idea of uh, individuals owning discrete little plots of land that they can do with what they want and keep others off of is a foreign concept. And that, of course, is at the basis of Euro-American settlement, the idea that I can purchase land, that I can make that land and thereby myself productive. 
Now it's important to think, to remember that when Euro-Americans begin to arrive in large numbers in this area, um, the people that are living here are farming and they're hunting in the same ways that they had um, for many hundreds of generations before. Um, but some European commentators will talk, American commentators will talk about how well the Indians aren't using the land. Well, they are using the land. They're, they're, they're subsisting on it. They're farming. Some of their farms are many, many dozens of acres large. Um, they're moving about the landscape, taking animals that they need for food, but also to sell um, in the fur trade. So it is productive land. Um, it is just not being used in the way that Euro-Americans think it should be used in. Um, and of course, there is a notion amongst many Euro-Americans uh, and Europeans that their culture is superior to Native American cultures and there's a strong desire to remove the Native Americans from these areas, open them up to Euro-American settlement. When that process really starts cooking, the Potawatomi are the people that are living at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, northern Illinois. Um, and they're living uh, a life that I just described as, as both farmers, but also as hunters and, uh, and traders within the fur trade. Um, and we have a very interesting group of objects from a site along the Kankakee River called the Windrose site. Uh, and it dates to between 1800 and 1830 uh, and represents the remains of a Potawatomi settlement of that time. And you really get a sense from the material that you're, that you're seeing here how much they have incorporated um, European technologies into their lifeways, but also how much of their own um, traditions have persisted. So there are, in fact, hunting tools here. Um, there's a spear for spearing muskrats. There are trade gun parts. Um, there are horse harness pieces. Uh, all of these would have been used in the hunting, um, in the hunting business. Um, but here you have, again, that continuation of native metalworking to create the kinds of decorative pieces that Native uh, Americans have valued for, for many hundreds of years. So tinkling cones, beads, and now those kinds of things. Taking the pot, the, the, the brass copper kettle, using it as a raw material to create distinct um, pieces of material culture. Um, we're finding that remnants of commercially available smoking pipes, but also handmade pipes. Again, um, looking back to long-standing traditions among Native communities. And one way of thinking, uh, one thought about this is that commercially produced pipes that are purchased from the fur trader might have been used for everyday smoking, as opposed to the handmade pipes um, that would have been used for more ceremonial smoking purposes. But a really interesting blending here uh, and, a, and an important and interesting look at um, the life of the Potawatomi kind of at the end of their uh, time here in northeastern Illinois. Um, we look in the exhibit at how quickly these people were dispossessed of their land through treaties um, with the United States government. We talk a little bit about the process uh, and then of course graphically illustrate here how between 1795 and 1834 how quickly Illinois passed from native hands to uh, Euro-American hands. Um, Indians that didn't want to go were often forcibly removed, as were those from northern Indiana uh, who were removed on the, what the Potawatomi when we re refer to today as the Trail of Death, um, force marched um, in November and December from their ancestral homes in Indiana to, um, to Kansas. Uh, and so the idea being, let's get rid of them. Um, they'll go away. They're a dying breed anyway. What we find, of course, is that they do none of these things and that native cultures continue to exist um, and thrive today, including the Potawatomi. Uh, and to bring their story into the present, we were able to um, borrow these uh, beautiful prints from Potawatomi uh, photographer and visual storyteller Sharon Hoogstraten, um, who has been recording contemporary Potawatomi uh, regalia amongst the various uh, Potawatomi nations uh, spread across uh, the Midwest. Um, beautiful um, looking 
uh, back at their traditions, uh, incorporating uh, the contemporary, um, but continuing to thrive despite the adversity and the, and the forced removal from our area uh, in places. The, 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 the Potawatomi of the Southern Lake Michigan area end up primarily in, in Kansas and Oklahoma, um, but there are other Potawatomi settlements, of course, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and other places as well. So to wrap up the exhibit, we, we, we come to the point at which large numbers of Euro-American settlers are arriving in what is DuPage County and, and the surrounding counties. Um, and again, with an emphasis on the lifeways. How are they living? How are they supporting themselves? Uh, and the vast majority of these people are farmers. Um, they're coming to the area to attempt to establish commercial farms like they would have known um, back east. Uh, or if they're coming up from the south, certainly to also develop farms on which they can support themselves and their families. And so we have materials here from the um, Thompson Paxton farm, which is down um, near where Fermi Lab is currently located. And these materials uh, date to the kind of um, probably 1830 to 1860 period. And just like the materials from the Windrow site, the Potawatomi village, these give a good sense of how people are living at that time. Um, there are materials related to how the house that they would have lived in. So cut nails, glass fragments, ceramic pieces, glass pieces, some parts of some toys, harmonica, uh, ceramic figurines, clothing, smoking pipes, again, commercially produced smoking pipes. This material is, of course, really fragmentary, and it is, as you look in all the cases through the exhibit, but that's a lot of times how archaeologists find this material in the ground. It's, it's fragmentary. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell a complete story. There are oftentimes you know, tantalizing details uh, that are left out. But by accumulating this material, by comparing this material to what's found in similar sites or adjacent sites or sites earlier or later in time, archaeologists can begin to tell a very complete story and paint a very complete picture of what life was at various times and places. When you get into an era where there are written records that can supplement the archaeological material, a very, very rich picture of life begins to emerge. There are a lot of people to thank for helping make this exhibit possible. Um, we were able to borrow materials, I think, from eight different institutions and several collectors, including the Downers Grove Museum, DuPage County History Museum, the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, Illinois State Museum, Logan Museum of Anthropology, Warrenville Historical Society, LaSalle County Historical Society, um, and then uh, uh, Nancy Himmis, Dan Lund, uh, Michael Roberts, um, all generously donated materials that they had collected to the exhibit. Um, but a special shout out to those uh, individuals and organizations that support the Elmhurst Heritage Foundation um, and through their generosity, help make exhibits like this one possible. Um, our silver sponsors include Gar uh, Community Bank of Elmhurst, Guaranteed Rate, John Nolden, Itasca Bank and Trust Company, Lakeside Bank, Michael B. LaCicero, Attorney at Law, Superior Ambulance, Storino, Ramello, and Durkin, Attorneys at Law. Our bronze sponsor is Ken Bartels Consulting. Friend sponsors include House of Glass, uh, My Car Wash, Weiss, Kunz, and Oliver, Mike's Meat Market. Um, and a special shout out to our platinum sponsor, Feezy Roofing, uh, for their generous support for this exhibit and other exhibits um, over the last couple of years. So thank you um, to all of you for what you do, and a special thank you to the Elmhurst Heritage Foundation for helping, um, helping us make what you see in the gallery possible. Um, check out our website, elmhursthistory.org, for information on upcoming uh, programs over the course of the spring and into the summer related to people of the prairie and upcoming exhibits. Um, I hope you're able to join us in person, but if not, I hope that we've been able to give you a little bit of a taste of what we have here in the gallery. Thanks. <laughs>